For 40 days, the spies had searched out the land and they came back with a report of its fruitfulness. How could they deny it? One massive bunch of grapes carried by two of them on a staff, those two, surely Joshua and Caleb, demonstrated the truth of its fruitfulness. The 10 couldn't deny the facts, but, but the land is full of cities with walls reaching high up into the sky. The people are strong, the people are many. We can take the city, says Caleb, as a result of which the 10 spies say this, there in Canaan, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Just as an aside, when those of the truth and those of the world look and draw the same conclusion, that's when there is a time to worry, and that's what happened here. The Israelites cannot defeat the giants, claimed the ten. Yes, we can, claim Caleb, who, despite his Gentile ancestry, was a man, of course, of the tribe of Judah. And so just a hundred years, a few hundred years later, that prophecy made by that great man of faith would be fulfilled to the letter. When Goliath, the giant of Gath, arose to defy the king and the people of Israel and indeed their God. And one man stepped forward to that conflict. One man stepped forward to meet with him, a man from Caleb's tribe, a man from the tribe of Judah. And he won with the father's blessing exactly as Caleb said he would. Now this evening, we're not going to think in any great detail about the the events leading up to the conflict itself or following the conflict. We're not even going to consider David's actions in any massive detail because of time, but this is what we hope to look at. So we have got to think about what the Bible says about the Philistines and what the Bible says, of course, about the man Goliath himself, the, the ultimate Philistine. What did he do and what did he say? Well, think about how he died. We'll think about what happened to his head and his armor, of course, types and shadows. And there are very many connecting this with the work of the Lord Jesus and his conquering of sin. And as we go through some lessons for you and me, what are the challenges for us? So what do we know then about the Philistines? First of all, before we think about this one key Philistine man, well, it's a simple fact that after Saul's day, brothers and sisters, they were nowhere near as effective in their conflicts with Israel as they were before that time. David's victory over Goliath swung the pendulum in Israel's favor. And though there was still conflict between the two nations afterwards, never again, or certainly not in David's day, did the Philistines have the upper hand. We won't turn to Genesis 10. If we did so, we would see that Ham had a son called Mizraim, and he had a son called Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim. Exactly the same name rendered Philistines elsewhere, for example, here in 1 Samuel 17. So a descendant from Ham. The name itself, Philistine, means migratory or rolling. That's what Strong's Concordance says. Jesenius says, the land of wanderers. And we might think that that's a little unusual because these people in Bible times, certainly in David's day, in the time of the judges, etc., they, they were men who had a home. They, they didn't move around. They weren't migratory. They weren't strangers and pilgrims. Well, actually, brothers and sisters, yes, indeed, prior to that time, they had been. Certainly, I say once again, in David's day, we have the five Philistine cities, and there they are to the west of Israel. They possess that land that we know today as the Gaza Strip and, and a little bit more besides. But it wasn't always the case. So we read in Jeremiah's prophecy, chapter 47, 
that the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant, notice, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Now, where is Kaftor? Same language is there in Amos chapter 9. Have I not brought the Philistines from Kaftor? And Kaftor seems to be Crete. In Zephaniah 2, we have the word Kerethites. You remember that there were Pelethites and Kerethites who follow David and the Kerethites certainly they were Philistines in their ancestry and the Septuagint perhaps some of us have little time for it but that's how it renders it it renders it Cretans so very probably they were men originally from Crete and that ties in with what we know about them and their pagan worship oh catch up if you would no right oh there we are the wonders of modern science. Notice, notice the, the head attire of Dagon, the Philistine god. It's a fish. He was a fish god, wasn't he? And of course, if you live on a small island, well, it's just as well if you like the taste of fish, because that's going to be the staple diet. So it seems most likely that the Philistines had migrated from that island down towards the land of Canaan and the border of Canaan, the, the coast coastal area specifically and that's where they dwelt of course with a common border with Israel and we think about that border in a few moments it's unsurprising that there was conflict between the two of course as we move on through the Old Testament we see that the Philistines were a a continual thorn in the side early on for the nation of Israel so in the days of the judges yes there were occasional victories so Shamgar in chapter 3 killed 600 of them with, with an ox goad. Then we have Samson. His, his whole life seems to be a continual conflict with these people. And of course, it would be surrounded by Philistines that he would die. And then we have Saul. Again and again, we find Saul doing battle with the Philistines. And very sadly, he and three of his sons, one of them being Jonathan, would die in a battle with these people the reign of david was different yes there there was warfare between the two nations two notable victories are described for us in second samuel 5 but generally speaking the israelites didn't suffer under the hand of the philistines in david's day anywhere near as much as they did prior to that time you see the work that was begun in the slaying of Goliath, that of Israel's domination of the Philistine people, continued right throughout David's reign as king. One final thought before we move on. There's the land promised to Abraham, a massive area. Of course, Israel today, the nation possesses nowhere near as much as that. And even in Bible times under David and Solomon, when they were their most successful, they still possess nowhere near that much land from these two rivers, the Nile to the river Euphrates, this great segment of land. Nonetheless, that is the area that was promised to Abraham and effectively Israel, as you enter the land, if only you will be faithful, this is the land that you can take it's, it's got your name on it if you have sufficient faith. And of course, included in the area that Israel did take, should have taken, there we find Philistine territory. Now, big, big question, which tribe was allocated that area? Come to Joshua chapter 15, please, before we look at our chapter 1 Samuel 17. So Joshua 15 and we are told this then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin southward was the uttermost part of the south coast and their south border, border was from the shore of the salt sea from the bay that looketh southward. So, so this is Judah's inheritance and one of the borders is the salt sea, the Dead Sea, as we know it today. What about the other side? Verse 12. And the west border was to the great sea. 
the coast thereof. This is the coast of the children of Judah round about according to their families. So here's the other coast, the Great Sea, as we know, of course, is the Mediterranean. So the land between those two seas was Judah's by right. It was Judah's. Pick up the record in verse 45. What do we know about these places? Ekron and her towns and her villages from Ekron, even to the sea, all that was all that lay near Ashdod with their villages, Ashdod with her towns and her villages, Gaza with her towns. No, you know that these are Philistine towns, three of the five. We're, we're missing two of them, Gath and Ashkelon, but, but nonetheless, these are Philistine towns there in the portion of land allotted to Judah. Who is the most famous Old Testament man from Judah? Of course it is David, the great slayer of the Philistines. By killing Goliath, by leading Israel in great battles and victories over the Philistines, what was he doing? He was taking the land that should have been Judah's anyway had his forebears been sufficiently faithful to deal with these Gentiles to dispossess them. Let's come back to our chapter then, please. 1 Samuel 17, where, of course, we'll spend the majority of our time this evening. 1 Samuel 17, where we're told the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko that belongeth to Judah, notice here, in the territory of Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes. Damin. And we're only going to think about one of those three place names there, Ephes Damin. Strong's Concordance says, the border, the boundary of blood drops. It was then and it is still today. The border between Israel and her enemies, the border between the ecclesia and the world is a place of blood place where lives are lost or if they come from the world into the ecclesia a place where lives are laid down in sacrifice notice the location specifically it's there in verse 2 and verse 3 they are in a valley they're in a valley the valley of elah we might call this the valley of the shadow of death you see if david goes down into that valley and he reaches Goliath, he stands close to him, then depending on where the sun is, he's going to be in that man's shadow, in the shadow of death. Elah means an oak. Goliath was this, this great oak tree of a man. He was going to be felled by the faithful warrior of Israel, by David. Verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. What do we know about the man first of all? Goliath's name means exile. Strong's and Jesenius support that. And he was indeed. You see, his, his ancestors were exiles, were they not? They had come from one place, Crete, and now they were in Israel's land and that situation had to be dealt with. His height, Assuming that a cubit is indeed around 18 inches and a span is around six inches, makes this man nine feet six inches tall. Now, there are those who question the inspiration of the Bible or, or indeed the inspiration of the whole of the Bible. And they will land on certain passages and say, well, that can't possibly be literal. Therefore, we are free to disregard other passages which clearly are not literal. And I'm not, I'm not here this evening to talk in any great detail about that subject. 
But the argument goes like this. It's physically impossible, biologically impossible for a man who is nine foot six tall to, to function in any way. It just His body wouldn't work. The heart couldn't possibly pump enough blood. His, his bones couldn't sustain his frame. It wouldn't work. Brothers and sisters, I don't wish to be flippant. Surely there are harder miracles than that. If God can raise the dead, then surely making a man nine foot six, big enough to be able to walk about and fight, is hardly a challenge. Scripture says it, brethren and sisters, and we accept it. Because according to Luke chapter one, with God, nothing is impossible. And I say once again, there are far more amazing things than this in God's word. So Goliath was a champion. Okay, a champion there in verse four. That word only means a man. That's all it means. It's the same Hebrew word normally rendered man. It's there in verse eight, choose a man. Same Hebrew word there in verse 10. Give me a man, says Goliath. But of course, he was more than just a man, wasn't he? He was the ultimate man. He was the, the very epitome of strength and arrogance and sin. What about his armor? What do we make of that? You can't possibly miss the material that was used here. It appears again and again. It's, it's brass or more correctly bronze because brass is, is an alloy and bronze is not. So probably bronze doesn't really matter. Nonetheless, what do we know about bronze? It, it can be made to look very good, but it takes effort and it doesn't last. When I was a young man, many a year ago, my junior school in Harborn in Birmingham, we had desks with inkwells. Now I'm not that old, we didn't dip the, the quills in, but the inkwells were there nonetheless, and they were, they were bronze. And it, it had on it, I think the name Kingfisher West Bromwich. And somebody said to me many years later, the brother, to the, so the company that, that made those inkwells with that name on, owned by a brother. Well, there we go, nonetheless. We all used to take something in to try and polish it up. So the, the young lady next to me, she had Duraglit. It was like little cotton wool balls and she'd polish it up and it shone. And my dad gave me a, a bottle of Brasso and a rag and I'd tip it and they would give it and it would look fantastic. Within a couple of days, it looked disgusting. That is bronze for you, that is brass. And that's the flesh. Because the flesh can be profitable. It can look good indeed. And here Goliath, as a man of the flesh, was strong and capable, and to a degree he was brave, but his glory wouldn't last. The lion of the tribe of Judah was going to cut him short. And notice, if you will, that there are six weaponry here listed in this section. A helmet, a coat of mail, greaves, a target, which is a chest plate, a spear, and a shield. Invariably, they are brass. Six is the number of flesh, the number of a man, and we have fleshly thinking. We have fleshly feeling. We have a fleshly direction. And we have fleshly protection. It speaks of the world, doesn't it? It speaks of everything that the world offers. Now, as an aside, who else had bronze armor? Verse 38, same chapter. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass or bronze upon his head. And he armed him with a coat of mail of itself. This isn't wrong. The metal was clearly malleable. It was strong and it was available. But, but surely it's appropriate that David refused this, not only because he hadn't proved it, but also because it spoke of the flesh and he would not have fleshly protection in that battle that he was about to take part in which he was about to take part verse 8 of our chapter Goliath stood and cried unto the armies of Israel said to them why are you come out to set your battle in array am not I a Philistine and ye the servants of Saul choose you notice this a man for you 
and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants? Interestingly, that promise was not fulfilled, but still. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. Little wonder the verse 11 tells us that Saul and the rest of Israel were terrified. Who would not be? But what do we make of, of Goliath's challenge here, brethren and sisters? What did he really want? He wanted one man to fight him. I don't want open warfare between two armies. I want a duel between me and one man from Israel. Now, now why was that? It's obvious when you think about it. Imagine two massive armies. And let's say these two armies are equally matched and they both have 20,000 men. Now, who, who's going to win? Who's to say it could go either way? Even if the most fearsome and capable warrior stands on one side, who's to say that his team will win? No guarantee is there. But of course, his strength will be diluted the more men there are. If, if it was 100 versus 100, well, he's probably going to be an advantage. 10 versus 10, he's certainly going to be an advantage. And one versus one, he can't possibly lose. That's the whole point. That's the reason Goliath challenged Israel to provide one man, because he knew, naturally speaking, that spelt victory for the Philistines. More than that, he didn't just want a man. He didn't just, who did he really want? Well, he mentions that, doesn't he? Aren't you the servants of Saul? He wanted to fight Saul. Why? Because, well, if you can beat the leader, then everybody else will toe the line. I used to work with a gentleman just off the A5, in fact, Aviston, and his son was a squaddy. And I was chatting with the lad. He came in the once, and we just talked about how things were going. Um, and I think he was being trained in Aldershot, which is a big, big military town. And I said, do you ever get grief when you go out in town and they know who you are? Oh, yeah, absolutely, he said. I said, what do you do? He said, ignore it until it's getting out of hand and then take down the leader and everybody else goes quiet. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what Goliath wanted to do here. If I can conquer your leader, nobody else will object. Brothers and sisters, naturally speaking, when you think about it, Saul was the man for the job, wasn't he? Let's assume that in, in 1 Samuel 17, the average man in Israel was about five foot six. Might have been shorter, we don't know, but of course with diet and medication, generally speaking, people are living longer and generally speaking, we're taller. But let's assume five foot six as your average man in Israel, which means a tall man in Israel is six feet or so. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. That makes Saul over seven feet tall and very simply, very, very much nearer the height of Goliath than anybody else. He was the man for the job. <laughs> Brethren and sisters, this is the reason he had the job. Come back to chapter eight, please. 1 Samuel chapter eight and it's verse five. Horrendous words to listen to from the people of Israel to the great faithful man, Samuel, nonetheless, they say to him, verse five, behold, thou art old. Thank you very much. Thy sons walk not in thy ways, true but hurtful. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Object, says God. So he did, and they wouldn't listen. And so what do they say? Verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, nay, but we will have a king over us that we may be like all the nations. Here we have it and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Very sadly, when Saul was needed, he was conspicuous by his absence. And I say that not to condemn the man, because let's face it, it would take an enormous amount of faith or courage or both to go out against Goliath. But that's the reason that he was chosen. 
That's the reason he was appointed. And like a vine that doesn't produce grapes or like unsalty salt, Saul, very sadly, brethren and sisters here, was obsolete as a king and as a leader. Well, as we move on through the record, we know what happened. David brought provisions for his brothers. He noted Goliath's challenge. He asked why somebody didn't do something, at which point one man was moved with anger. Verse 28 of 1 Samuel 17. And Eliab, David's eldest brother, heard when David spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou lest thy few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. This is the man, brethren and sisters, that when Samuel saw him for the first time, he said in his heart, wow, this is the one then. Here's the next king of Israel. Don't look on the outward appearance, says God. I look on the heart. And David's heart was like God's, and Eliab certainly at this point was not. What, what was Eliab's complaint? You're a little boy. You know, see, I don't think he was a little boy. He couldn't possibly be, and otherwise Saul wouldn't have tried to give him his armour, but still. You, you know, see, you're arrogant. Oh, and by the way, who have you left your few sheep within the wilderness? What an insult that was. Number one, you've only got a few sheep, you're nothing. What have you got three of them and one of those is dying do you know what i mean and by the way you're not even a good shepherd you don't take them to pasture you've left them in a place of death well of course david was nothing like that at all but that was eliab's accusation against him you're not even a good shepherd he was wrong david was a good shepherd as indeed was the lord jesus christ you just you just want to see the battle you're not interested in in getting your hands dirty. Did you notice here how in this section, three great tall men all despise David? Eliab as head of the family, Saul as king of the land, and the enemy Goliath. They all say to David, what do you think you're doing? You can't do this. You're not, you're not fit for, to, to do this job. They were all of them wrong. And in due course, you know, we might say, David replaced them all. He replaced them all. Eliab was the firstborn, but the blessing of the firstborn didn't go to him. It went to David. Saul was the king of the land, but destined to be replaced by another. And that other, of course, as we know, was David. What about Goliath? Did he really replace Goliath? Brethren and sisters, he did. In one sense, he did. Come to 2 Samuel 15, please. And here we have David fleeing from Jerusalem, fleeing from Absalom, who has taken the kingdom. And various different men follow him, one of them being a man called Ittai the Gittite, there in verse 19. Verse 18, and all his servants passed on beside him, and all the Kerathites, and all the Pelathites, and all the Gittites, 600 men, which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. It's one of the most moving accounts in David's life. And he actually says to it, oh, look, you've, you've only just arrived. Just, just go, you're so faithful and kind, go home. I can't ask you to, to follow me where you might lose your life. And it, I says, it doesn't matter. I'd rather lose my life by your side than return to the land of the Philistines. And that's what he did. David was a leader of men and women from Gath who naturally would have followed Goliath. You see, he'd replaced all these three great tall men. Now, we're not going to consider in any detail Saul's conversation with David or, or David's refusal of the armour of the king and his choosing of the five smooth stones. All sorts of lessons that we could draw out, but time just doesn't allow us. Pick up the record, please, in verse 41 of our chapter. So David is about to do battle. Verse 41, the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Before we go any further, does something strike you as rather strange there? I might even say wrong. 
Goliath had called for one man, hadn't he? One man. He said, just me versus one of you. And yet when David goes, Goliath's there with his armor bearer. This is completely contrary to what Goliath has requested. And we might say, if indeed the armor bearer was there when the conflict took place and it didn't last long, he didn't do his job very well, did he? So that shield should have blocked that stone, but it didn't do it. It didn't do it. Verse 42. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Number of points of interest. Firstly, there seems to have been some kind of preliminary conversation, opportunity for these two contestants to, to engage before the battle took place. And wouldn't that have been terrifying, brethren and sisters, to stand close by and speak to this man, to look up and see this great giant of an individual. Goliath cursed him by his gods, plural. David served the one true God. And it doesn't matter how many pagan idols you worship, Philistines, they are no match for Israel's God. And notice how he disdained him there in verse 42. That's usually translated despised elsewhere in the Old Testament. In fact, it's the same word as in Genesis 35, where Esau despised his birthright. Now, what does that remind us of? He looks upon David, he is but a youth, and he despises him. But what about these words? 1, 1 Timothy 4, 12, Paul says to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Don't let anybody look down upon you because you are young. And that's an important principle that we can and should take into ecclesial life. You know, we may disagree with young brethren and sisters on a whole host of subjects, indeed. Sometimes there will be disagreements. Let, let's never tell them that they're wrong because they're young. <laughs> when you've been in the truth as long as I have you, that's a very poor argument to use, brethren and sisters. Disagree by all means. If they're wrong, tell them they're wrong, that's fine, but not wrong because they're young. That is despising somebody's youth am i a dog <laughs> am i a dog says goliath actually yes indeed you are david could have said and maybe he did say under his breath you see dogs in bible times they were wild they were scavengers they weren't domesticated although it's there is evidence to support domestication of the dog began in israel of all places but they were outside the covenant so we read in Psalm 22, dogs have compassed me. They're enemies, they're Gentiles, they're outside. They, they are those who reject God's word. Revelation 22, without are dogs, aliens. This is what Goliath was. But of course, David was there with great faith and he declared the reason for his confidence is absolute certainty that he would be victorious that day. Verse 45, then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear, with a javelin or a, or a shield. I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now, very many people throughout scripture have spoken in the name of God. How often do we read the prophets? Thus saith the Lord, or, or the Lord said to me, how many people came in the name of the Lord? I couldn't find many. Here's the classic example. Mark in 1 Samuel 17, and come to Matthew 21, please. And here, of course, we have the Lord Jesus coming to Jerusalem at the start of the final week of his life. Verse 9, and the multitudes that went before 
and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And though these people didn't know what Jesus had come to do, they thought he was there to, to throw off Roman rule and, and to reign. They were wrong. Jesus had come to do battle with his own personal Goliath, with his own giant, that is King Sin. And there at the place of a skull, the victory was complete. And we'll think about that a little bit more later, God willing. Let's move on to the, the conflict itself. And I say once again, it didn't last very long. David ran to meet the enemy, very different from the 10 spires who, who were fearful of the giants and effectively ran away. Verse 49 of our chapter, David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. But the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, there are those who have surmised that Goliath was a man with a very large pituitary gland. It, it's said that those who are extremely tall have enlarged pituitary glands. And it is said by those who know that a blow just there, because of this particular uh, enlarged gland, can kill a man with a very large pituitary gland. I'm, I'm not a doctor, I absolutely cannot say, but, but that's what has been suggested. Putting that to one side, the reason for David's success, fourfold. Number one, his skill with a sling and a stone. There's no disputing it. You know, that, that was a, a beautiful piece of, of, such a word, slingsmanship on the part of David. Secondly, his faith and his courage. Thirdly, the father's blessing. Clearly, God was blessing his faithful servant that day. But also, we might say, Goliath's unpreparedness. He must have had a gap in his helmet, mustn't he? What are we being shown? Protection of the world is no protection at all. Of course, a blow to the head which causes death takes us right back to Genesis 3. Goliath was the very epitome of sin, wasn't he? And David was the, the symbol of the seed of the woman, the one who overcame. It's a point of forward to the work of the Lord Jesus, as we have seen. And that's further confirmed in what follows. Verse 51, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath thereof, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they weren't servants to Israel as had been promised, but rather they fled. Now, a very simple point, if I may, here. Where did David take that sword from? Did he prize it from Goliath's lifeless hand? Not at all, brethren and sisters. He took it out of its sheath. It wasn't even drawn when Goliath died. Okay, maybe he had a spear in his hand, we don't know. But which soldier enters a battle with a weapon safely stowed away? One who can't see the dangers that are before him or is too arrogant to believe that he could ever lose. Again, does anything strike you as strange here? Goliath was dead, verses 49 and 50 prove that. But David still chops off his head. Why is that? He uses the sword to sever Goliath's head. Well, maybe to show that all the weapons of this world are completely and utterly impotent compared with our God and the power that he possesses, and indeed to confirm the victory. But, but why decapitate a corpse? Well, to show that the one in question was totally and utterly powerless. We're not going to turn to Jude, but in the letter of Jude, there are six what we might term metaphors of evil, you know, clouds without water. One of them is false brethren would be twice dead. That's what Goliath was. Jude verse 12, twice dead, killed by the stone, head cut off by the sword. And what happened to the severed head? Of Goliath. Well, as we know, it was carried by David. 
And he stood there in the presence of Saul, holding the head, verse 57. Yet verse 54 steps back in time. So verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, put his armor in his tent. The head was taken to Jerusalem. Why? Because at that time, Jerusalem, or Jebus as it was called, was still occupied by Gentiles. Israel had never taken that city. They wouldn't do so until David ruled over the whole of the nation. Indeed, it is his first act as king over the whole of Israel and Judah is to go and to take Jerusalem. And I have a personal view, which I cannot prove. It's just a thought. To me, it seems logical that David in his days as a shepherd went far and wide searching for pasture. And as he did so, he took them to the fields round about Jebus. And he swore that day that if ever I can do anything to rid that city of Gentiles, I would do it. And so when opportunity presented itself, he was faithful to that vow. Why did he do it, brethren and sisters? Why take Goliath's head to Jerusalem? Firstly, a symbol of what he would do in, in taking that city, but more importantly, as a symbol of what Jesus would do, his greater son. And in this respect, remember what David did. He, he went out on behalf of the whole nation. What was Goliath saying? I want a representative man from Israel to fight me. I want Saul, but if he won't come, anybody will do. I don't mind anyone because I can't possibly lose because here I am nine foot six with all my beautiful bronze armor. And naturally speaking, he was right. I want a man to represent Israel. Isn't that the language we use of Jesus in his defeat of sin? A representative man. He represented all mankind. What of the place where Jesus died? We know these words well. We won't turn to John 19. Jesus bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And of course, it then goes on to say, which means the place of a skull. It comes from a Hebrew word. I'm not very good at Hebrew, but it would probably be pronounced something like this, Golgoleth, which means a skull or a head. And, and that's used 12 times in the Old Testament, never ever as a proper noun, always, always as a noun. Just come please to First Chronicles 10. First Chronicles 10. And here we have the tragic end of Saul. Verse 8, and it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines were come to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And when they had stripped him, they took his head, that's our word, and his armour, sent it into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their people, to their idols, to their people. And they put his armour in the house of their gods and fastened his head. There's our word, Golgoleth in the temple of Dagon. Why did they do that? Because that's what David had done to their champion, brethren and sisters. That's what David had done to Goliath. What about the armor? David buried the armor. We saw that in, in his tent. I should at that point have talked about a stone coming in and smiting another image, another great giant. That's what Jesus will do. But Jesus himself spoke about armor. So he said this, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overtake him, overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Do you think the Lord Jesus was referring back to David and Goliath? It's exactly what David did exactly what David did. He took his armor, his armor that he had trusted in. Final couple of points, if I may, that the final part of Goliath's armory, indeed the only part of Goliath's armory that ever appears again in scripture is of course his sword. 
Presumably, initially, it was placed there in David's tent with the greaves and the spear and the target of brass, etc. But in due course, it was moved because by the time we come to 1 Samuel 21, it is stored in a priestly city called Nob, kept safely by the priests there. It's, it's never mentioned again directly, except that David comes to Nob and says, if you've got a sword, yes, we've got this one. Wow, that's the one. There's nothing like that. Give it to me, says David. Now, do you think David ever used that sword? I'm going to suggest to you that he did. I want you to come, please, to 1 Samuel 24 for our final reference. And here we have Saul pursuing David, wanting to kill him, chasing him from pillar to post. And this is one of the occasions when David has the opportunity to kill Saul. There in a tent, in a cave rather, David and his men, Saul comes in without realizing that David's hiding in the sides of the cave. And Saul lays down and goes to sleep. Way, this is the opportunity, say the men. This is what you've been waiting for. Verse four, men of David said unto him, behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand. Thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And later it smote him that he did that. And we know that that repentance was genuine because when he had the opportunity to do the same thing again, a couple of chapters later, he wouldn't do it. The point, brethren and sisters, is this. He was severing, I believe, the blue ribbon that they were told to put at the bottom of their garments to think of our heavenly father and his ways. Saul, you've forgotten all about God, says David. But what do you think he used to sever Saul's garment? Could have been any kind of a knife, couldn't it, brethren and sisters? Do you not think it was Goliath's sword? Would it not have been Goliath's sword? You see, had Saul accepted Goliath's challenge, what might have happened? Goliath probably would have won and Saul's blood would have been shed almost certainly by that very sword. So David spared Saul from having to face that sword twice. Once when he fought Goliath in Saul's place and once when he stayed his men who wanted to use that sword to pin Saul to the ground. What have we seen this evening, brethren and sisters? We've seen that Goliath was the ultimate warrior. He was terrifying, he was confident, he was strong, he was superbly equipped, and he was determined to face any foe. In the natural series of events, he was just about unbeatable. Then along came a young man from the, from the tribe of Judah, coming in faith and coming in the name of Yahweh, Israel's God. He would not be swayed by those who told him he was unsuitable or, or ill-prepared. He went out in faith with things that he had proved and by the grace of God he won and Israel was delivered from bondage. And all of these things point forward to our Lord and our Master the greater, the greatest son of David, who slew sin with that blow to the head, not with conventional weaponry of this age, not with a sword, as there was no sword in David's hand, but he did so by laying down his life. What, what lessons there are for you and me in this astonishing Old Testament story, brethren and sisters, and what a promise there is for us, if only we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Let me ask you one final question, if I may. Why was David so utterly certain that he would win? He could not possibly lose because he knew that one day he had to be king. That's why he'd been anointed by Samuel. He hadn't yet become king because Saul still holds that position. So I cannot possibly die because that promise of God has not been fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, are we not promised that we will be kings and priests in the age to come? Do we therefore share his faith, his courage in the battles with our giants? One day we hope and pray very soon, all Goliaths will fall. No more sinful men and women and governments and tyrants and, and nations bent on destruction and death. They will have no power 
before the immortal rulers of the age to come. And like those Israelites who shared David's glory at his side, we are being called to share that age of righteousness, to be allied with the Son of God, purifying the earth, saving the children of the poor and needy, and breaking in pieces every oppressor. May that promised day be very near. Thank you.